Good morning and welcome to FCC Online. We're looking forward to our time together. Glad you've tuned in today. Well, today we finish up a series on uh, threads that we have been doing now for several weeks, looking at how we can share the gospel with one another. I want to tell you about the next series we're getting ready to start next Sunday as we take a look at the book of Malachi, last book of the Bible, um, actually looking at what happens with the silence before a storm. There's 400 years where we don't hear anything else from God before Jesus finally appears. And we're going to look at that last prophetic book uh, over the next six weeks and just wanted to let you know about that. This coming Thursday at, at 7 p.m., you can join in our chapel for the gift program, God is Faithful Today and Tomorrow, where we hear different testimonies being shared about what God is doing in the lives of people. This coming Thursday, we have the opportunity to hear from our own Cheryl Dexter as she talks a little bit about what it's like to deal with cancer and what it has done in her life, how God has transformed her. Would you come and be a part of that gathering and the special music that's going to be a part 7 p.m. this coming Thursday? Well, how can we say thank you again for what it is you've done in donating uh, money toward our Military Bible Sticks project that happens over the month of May, uh, giving the Word of God by, um, by, by sound to people that will actually have them on M3 players uh, for uh, many of our troops uh, who are serving presently, um, also for U Ukrainian people who are on the go. For Ukrainian soldiers and Russian soldiers, we thank you for it. I just want you to know the total that, that came in for this year's project, $7,850 toward this project. That purchase purchases 314 military Bible sticks. And if we just look over the last seven years or so that we've been doing this experience, um, that raises our total to 1,000. 400 military Bible sticks. And I just want to say thank you and God bless you for what it is you're doing in sharing the Word of God with those who need to hear it. Our students and children's ministry are taking off in regards to what it is that's happening this summer. This week we have um, basketball camps that are coming. Later on we're going to be having volleyball camps here that you can be a part of. Our children's ministry have activities that are happening. Our student ministry is getting ready to go to CIY Move and to camp and to mix and uh, just so many things are going on. Would you be praying for those who are leading them and also for uh, the number of students who are going to be changed over uh, the course of this summer because of their fellowship and their kinship together? Uh, would you be in prayer for our student and children's ministry as they continue to keep moving forward? So today we're taking a look at where do we go from here? Where do we weave from here in our stories with our threads? How do we take this thing to the next level and be able to see that we're actually making some progress? How do we move people from where they are in our conversations to a place where they begin to flourish? And we're going to see it from the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2. Uh, is where we're going to hone our time in today, kind of looking at the early church and seeing how they did life and what we can learn from them. And so I want to pray about that opportunity as we get started. Uh, so would you bow your heads and we'll pray together before we open up God's word. Lord, we thank you again for being the creator of the universe. You are so good. And we just love you so much. And we thank you again for the opportunities of being able to come as the body of Christ. And we're asking God that you would challenge us and move us and make us different. That we would find new ways that we not only could move ourselves into a, de a better position, but we could help others do the same. I thank you so much for the word of God. And I thank you for how it divides uh, even to bone and to marrow. We thank you for how it separates. And I pray, God, that you would use us and use us uh, today as we uh, glorify you in our worship, as we again open up your word that we might be challenged to be better people. Thank you again for this time of worship. Thank you for the people that are tuned in today. I pray, God, that you would challenge us and make us different now. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, let's get started today. You know, as we get started this morning, I, I kind of think through and wonder whether or not sometimes we either aren't using our threads in the right direction or when we finally have used them in the right way, we're not using that fabric then for another purpose. Um, I share this story with you uh, to get us started this morning uh, about a, a true story about what really could happen uh, if we were to take our threads and to use them in a way that we thought we were going to use them, but not for the same reason. When there was a group of women in New York in a church who were eager to help a missionary newly assigned to an Indian leper colony. Now, they were thrilled with the mountains of fabric spread before them. For four weeks, 
They'd collected old sheets from the people at their church, carefully cut each sheet into eight-inch strips, and finally they packed them and they mailed all that fabric. The new missionary could distribute them as bandages for the Indian people. Well, two weeks later, the sheet fragments arrived in India and the American missionary joyfully passed them out to his new Indian friends. Delighted, the men and women of the leper colony gathered together with all of the new fabric bandages. And one woman held up the fabric strip and enthusiastically proclaimed, you know, if we sew these together, we'll have pretty good sheets. <laughs> and I just wonder if what we sometimes think we're doing is not what we think we're doing. And I just want to make sure that today we're clear on what it is we're supposed to be doing. How do we take the threads of what we've been sharing in our story and help us and help others to move into the journey that we have with Christ Jesus? Well, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2 today, and uh, we're going to start in verse 36, which is really uh, after a lot of other things. And I don't want to tell that whole story, so I'm going to challenge you uh, in your own homework to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 35. But let me just give you a little background on the information before we jump into verse 36 because of where we're starting. Here's the background. Christ Jesus has died on the cross for our sins, and he's risen from the dead. And the Lord then met many of his followers at different times in different places over a 40-day period. Well, then Jesus ascended back into heaven, telling his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they had received the promise of the Holy Spirit. Then 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down in power, and the 120 believers flooded into the street to proclaim the wonderful works of God. And God miraculously gave them the power to speak in foreign languages so that the Jews gathered from all over the world could hear the news about Christ Jesus. And then Peter began to preach and the church exploded and new members came and that's where we're going to start our story in Acts chapter 2 and we're going to start in verse 36 and we're going to read through the end of the chapter in verse 47. Let's take a look at that. It says, Peter said, therefore all of Israel be assured of this that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Well, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all from whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, there's a, where do we go with these threads, with these pieces of fabric? How do we formulate them into something, either, whether it's a quilt or a sheet, or whether we can use them for bandages, or we can use them as rags? Help us to figure out, God, how we can move forward into weaving our story and what we need to do. And so there's some gospel threads in this story that requires some stitching. And so I want to give you five today that I think are going to help us to move into this required stitching of how we go about weaving our story and finishing up this part of it. The first one is this, and we find it in verses 36 through 41. It's spreading the news that everyone needs a Savior. Everyone needs a Savior. This is what we've been spending the last few weeks talking through. Peter wanted the people he was speaking with to know that they needed a Savior. And I'm calling you today again toward the need for a Savior. Everyone needs this Savior, and you must call all of those around you to the Savior. Christ Jesus wants to be their Savior. 
And you and I want them to be part of the body of Christ. And so I would say this in this first idea, we need to identify with the body of Christ. You and I are called to identify with the body of Christ, other believers. The church needs to be a growing church. It's the kind of church that God wants us to be. And Peter reminds us of this truth in verse 36 when he said, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He said, Let them all know. Peter wanted everybody to know that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Savior of the world, that he died on a cross for our sins, that Jesus rose from the dead, and that we need to turn away from sin and selfishness and turn toward Christ Jesus. And I would say this, compel people to ask you, to ask you this question, what should I do about Jesus? I mean, wouldn't it be something to know that friends and family and folks uh, who you work with and go to school with and, and laugh with would be compelled, compelled like these folks were in the early parts of the church. Verse 37 says they had a wonderful thing and they said, what should I do now? What should I do about this Jesus I've heard about? I want you to know it's what I've been praying for this church. As I've been bringing these messages, I I can't think of any better thing in your life, in your woven story, your example would be to some friend, some neighbor, some sports friend, some coworker could be, what should I do about Jesus? They they, they have heard you, they've watched you, and they go, I want to know more about this Jesus you're talking about. These folks were compelled to want more. And to compel in Greek means to constrain to doing so with urgency as a pressing necessity. What a wonderful piece of fabric this would look like. Shoot for that as a goal if you would. Have them see your story and watch your life in such a way that they're begging you to tell them about, about Jesus. Verse 38 gives them the answer for what they're compelled to do. Put your trust in Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit by receiving Jesus as your personal Savior. Be baptized and seek to follow Jesus in every area of your life. That's what God wants for you and for your children, for all the people in our community, for people all over the world. Everybody needs to know because God cares about everybody, and God wants you to help spread the good news. A generation of people met up with Jesus, and the church exploded on this day. And I just want you to know it can still happen today right here in this town. All of this then brings us to verse 42, which is the second part of our text that we want to take a look at in weaving our story. What do we need to stitch things life together together by staying in touch with others? Verse 42 is clear about that. We invest in the body of Christ. So we want to invite people to be part of the body of Christ, and now we want to invest them. And Luke is letting us know in the book of Acts what was making a church, keeping a church, and growing a church. Verse 42 breaks it down for every person. Listen to it again as we read it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Four things to invest in the body of Christ, and we're going to take a look at each one of them. The first one is to the apostles teaching god expects the study of his word because it's a sign of maturity peter in first peter chapter 2 verse 2 said like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that they may grow up in our salvation one reason we make every effort to choose the right decision is due to sometimes a lack of knowledge and understanding when we make mistakes And the Bible says that the inability to distinguish from right and wrong is a sign of immaturity. And as the believer understands the truth and practices it on a regular basis, it will lead to personal growth. And changes will take place and character will be strengthened. And if the church is filled with illiterate believers, they'll easily stumble and give up. And immature behavior will destroy us. Listen to 2 Peter 3, verses 16 through 18. He writes the same way, it says this, he writes the same way in all of his letters. Speaking in them them of these matters, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do with, with with other scriptures, to their own destruction. 
Therefore, dear friends, since we have been forewarned, be on guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. And so the challenge is to go to the depths of listening to others, understanding his word and praying for the needs. As verse 42 says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. The NIV says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And if you know anything about who we are as a church, you know one of the first things we say is our mission is that we are devoted to Jesus. How do you get devoted to Jesus? You spend time with him. And Bible study is certainly one of the most important areas of life. You can do it in a group. You can do it with another individual. You can certainly do it by yourself. There's no way for us to overstate the importance of studying the Word of God. No matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how long you know, you still need to study the Word of God. And God's Word's like an ocean. You might have known how to swim for years, but there are places and depths, places you've never seen before, that if you, if you know how to swim, you can go and see some things you've never seen before. And I want you to know the first church gathered for Bible study as should ours. But the second thing that, that we're encouraged to do in regards to this idea is that we're supposed to fellowship with one another. They devoted themselves to fellowship, but the word is koinonia, our fellowship connecting an idea, being a, a partner, being a sharer, being an associate, being a participant. Because believers share something and some, someone in, contact, in, the, in, in context of God and his blessings. And we should be committed to each other despite our differences and difficulties. Your common bond should be the basis for staying together and overcoming barriers. First John chapter 1, verse 3 says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, we are passionate for people. That's another part of our mission statement, to be devoted to Jesus and to be passionate for people. The early believers devoted themselves to fellowship, and the word denotes literally means, or devotes, means to continue steadfastly, to wait on. Applying it to fellowship, it means to adhere to one another, to be steadfastly attentive to one another, to persevere and to not faint in relating to each other. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, great text of scripture reminds us again, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching, see the first church gathered for fellowship as should ours. The third thing that he talked about in verse 42 is that we are devote, they were devoted to the breaking of bread why would they do such a thing? Well, if you remember in the upper room, it's where Jesus did that very thing with those he cared the most for. Jesus wanted to be remembered, and they had a meal together. I mean, we celebrate with a little cup and a, and a small piece of cracker, but they had a meal together. They talked together. They fellowshiped together. And there's something about breaking bread together that is not just communion, but an opportunity for us to have conversation. And so the body of Christ remembered the first church gathered for the breaking of bread, and so should ours. The fourth thing um, that was talked about by Luke in verse 42 is that they gathered for prayer. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. They continued to keep praying. Church, we may not have the apostles today, but we've got the same God, and he's got the same power he's always had. James Gilmore was a missionary in Mongolia who said, unprayed for, I feel like a diver at the bottom of a river with no connecting airline to the surface, or like a, fish, fire, like a fireman using an empty hose on a burning building. But with prayer, I feel like David facing Goliath. You remember how David felt when he faced Goliath? Samuel chapter 17, verse 45 and 46, David told the giant, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. The day of the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp to the Philistines and the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I want to talk like that, don't you? 
And the missionary said with prayer, I feel like a David facing Goliath. And that's the way that God wants you to feel. And so you need to gather for prayer, knowing that God will do great things and answers to those prayers. Let's take a look just at a couple of chapters ahead. After Peter and John were put into prison, we find that the believers in Jesus all gathered while they were in prison. And here's what they said in verse 23. It says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together. And in prayer to God, they said, sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke of the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant from our father David. Whom do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, who you anointed. When they did what your power, will, and had decided before, be, beforehand should happen, and now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak their word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they had prayed, the place where their meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You see, folks, the first church gathered for prayer, as should ours. So our third piece in finding out how we can weave from here and how we can stitch up life in such a way that it's useful, we need to seek more reverence for God. It's found in verse 43 of our text today. I want you to know there is a spiritual famine of godly fear. We see it in the early church. Verse 43 says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. That's the new King James Version of that verse that we just read. And the order in this verse is really interesting to me. I mean, you would think that the order would be reversed. You see signs and wonders, and then you would go, oh my, I'm afraid. But reverence came first. And the reason sin is so large and folks are so lost is because of the spiritual famine of the reverence of the fear of God. Too many of us are too comfortable with where we think we are with God, and we lose a healthy fear of God so many are parched in this world. They are such desperate need for spiritual water, for nourishing spiritual food, for spiritual shelter that can only come from the rock of God's salvation. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. That's a reverence for God. A famine lingers and the stench of those dying around us should move us to step into a reverence for God again. I, I read this story for, for you. Um, that's a sad one, but to me it speaks of what we've actually got going on in the spiritual famine of reverence. A scientist conducted an experiment in which he made cocaine available to some monkeys. These monkeys could pull on a lever in the cages to release a little cocaine into their feeding tray. Not surprisingly, the monkeys became addicted to the drug. And as the experiment continued, the scientists found that if the addicted monkeys could not get additional cocaine hits at, at any time they wanted by just pulling the lever, all of them would overdose. They all ended up killing themselves. The scientists then tried another experience with addicted monkeys, and they began to withhold the fix, the monkey, when they pulled on the lever. Over and over, these monkeys pulled on the lever, trying to get cocaine. They continued to pull the lever not 10 times, not 100 times, not even 1,000 times. Those addicted monkeys pulled on it an average of 12,800 times. Now, why would I tell you that story? Because I believe that we have a group of people, and maybe some of them are us, where we go to God and we pull on the lever and we feel like there's nothing there. We go and we think there's nothing there because we, we don't know who he is. We've come for the wrong things. We've grabbed the wrong intensity and we find ourselves spiritually depleted, depleted because we keep going to the world to pull on the lever to find the next thing that might bring me some happiness, might bring me some joy. And we have never once invested in them the story of who Christ Jesus is. And so may we find that we get ourselves in a spot where we're reverent 
We're re- we're, we are revering who God is. We're, we are revering what Christ has done for us. We understand the depth of his, of his ability to come and die for us. Because the more reverence, the more you see God work in your life. And oh, how I want you to pull on that lever where you get more of God and more of God and more of God instead of more of what this world is offering, which is nothing but your reverence for God. See, there's no real worship when we don't have godly fear. Psalm 111 verse 10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you want to get smart? You want to wise up to who's really in charge? Not you, not me. Only the almighty, sovereign God of the universe will give us what our spirit is looking for. It really is possible for anyone to have, is it really possible for anyone to have too much reverence? Is, is there anyone here who thinks they have enough reverence for the Lord? Every one of us need more reverence for God. And the good lesson for us here is that the more reverence that you have for God, the more you will see him work in your life. And the more reverence you have for God, the more you will see him work in ways that you never even expected. So as we come to this fourth piece in this text about how we can better weave our stories and where do we weave from here so that we're creating material and fabric that's useful in the future, we need to find ourselves sticking together as the body. Sticking together as the body. We come and we place ourselves along the side with the rest of the body of Christ. Commitment to the Messiah implied commitment to the Messianic community, and that is the church. And this commitment to the Messianic community includes commitment to overcome difficulties and differences with one another. I mean, whose responsibility is this? In verse 44, it says, All of the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and good they gave to anyone as he had need. And here we can see that in, it's everyone's business to address difficulties and, and differences and, and, and to meet a particular need. And the strength of our fellowship is not in our personal ideas or our opinions or our nationality, but our common relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Our common relationship with God should cause us to, to be humble toward one another. Each must be willing to set aside our own personal interest and uphold the interest of the community. And every time we come for fellowship, let's look after our community's interest. We, the church, we stick together. And Jesus called us to stick together in John chapter 17. Why? Because Jesus knew that we needed the body of Christ. And he knew that we would run into one another and it would get in the way of what we're going to do. Listen to John as we hear uh, Jesus' words. John 17, verses 20 through 23. It says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and I, and you and me, and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them to the glory that you have given gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me May they be brought up to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. See, Jesus wants you and me to stick together and not tear apart. And we have to find a way to be one. We have to fight to be one. The world will notice what we do. And here's the point where I would ask you to grab your communion. You would think after I'd be talking about, you know, they broke bread together that we'd stop and remember communion. But I want you to go ahead and grab your communion here because here's the idea I want you to hear today. Jesus will come for his bride. And when I say his bride, I mean the whole bride. What a beautiful picture that Jesus sews into the threads of his stories about the bride coming for the bridegroom, the church. The bridegroom is going to come for the bride. We are his bride, and Jesus is our bridegroom. We, we hear about it when Jesus is questioned about fasting. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, Jesus answered, How can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will take them from them, 
and they will fast. We also see it when Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25 about his return and how those virgins need to be ready with their oil lamps lit. Jesus talks of the bridegroom coming for his bride. We also see it when John the Baptist describes Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 25. He says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom and the friend who attends the, bride, attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he appears for the bridegroom's voice and that joy is mine and it is now complete. We read also about it in John in Revelation 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 about the bridegroom coming back for his bride and in all of these occasions Jesus is wanting his bride to stick together when he comes back for us. But listen to how Jesus personalizes his bride, the church. When Paul is bringing help to the church in Ephesus about marriage, of all things, listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, as we get ready to commune together. Husbands, he says, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless you see christ jesus wants us to stick together because we are his bride and the bridegroom died he gave up his life on behalf of his bride his church because he wants us to be holy and stain free. Let's pray and thank him about that moment. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to return again to these moments where we hold bread and a cup in our hand and we recall again how much you love your bride, that you would be willing to give up your life for all of us, your bride, the whole bride, and we thank you for, for sticking with us. And I know that you want us to stick together and so I pray, God, that in unity, as we draw our lips to the bread and to the cup, in unity, we'll find ourselves not just demonstrating being one, but how we can live as one with one Savior. Thank you for coming and dying for each one of us, for giving up your life, and for, again, wanting to return because you've conquered death and you want to return and bring your bride home. So thank you again for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, church family, as the body of Christ, let's take this bread and let's again remember his body that was sacrificed on our behalf to give us life. And one more time, as the bride, the church, we find ourselves lifting this cup and remembering the blood that was shed on our behalf to make us stain free, to cleanse us and to make us holy. Let's drink and remember him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And then we come to this last point in how we can weave a fabric in such a way and stitch it together in such a way that it will last. The fifth thing is sharing what God has given you. Sharing what God has given you. We see it in verses 44 through 47. We'll kind of reflect back and forth on that a bit. It's where we invite others into the body of Christ. I mean, who doesn't want to be invited into something that's helping others? devoted to the same purpose in Christ Jesus, inviting people to be part of something that's living and growing and changing for the better. The early church had a great handle on sharing. And here's just some of the things they shared. They shared life together. We've already kind of talked a little bit about this. It was they were a caring church. They were passionate for people and they were committed to serving them. And over and over again, we see them dealing with their life and selling their possessions and goods. And every day they continued to keep meeting. They shared life together. We also see them sharing stuff together. They were a generous church. We see it in verses 45 and 46. Now all believed together had everything in common. They sold their possessions and goods, divided them among everyone who had need. There's no evidence that this was done. There is no evidence that this was done in, in the other New Testament churches. In fact, the other churches later took up collections for the church in Jerusalem. But here you have a difficult and desperate situation. These Jews had come from all over the world for the Feast of Pentecost and they expected to soon go home and they heard the gospel, trusted in Jesus Christ and decided to stay. 
Plus, the persecution was just around the corner for every one of them. The principle here for us is that as the Lord leads, we should generously help those who are in need. God wants all believers to be givers, giving your time, giving your talents, giving your tithes and offerings. And if we are really growing spiritually, we will give. Would you dream of being a generous church with me? Now listen how the church responded when Peter and John were arrested. This is after the prayer that I read to you earlier. But in Acts chapter 4, we, we read one more time what it was that they found out. And it says this in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says that all of the believers were one in heart and in one in mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and, made, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. That's a great statement. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, bought the money, brought the money in the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I wonder if he wasn't selling his property so he could go and be a missionary with Paul. What happens whenever we become a generous church? They were also, a sh they were also sharing joy. This church was. They were sharing joy. They were a glad church. We see this truth backed up in verse 41, but we're gladly receiving the word of God. But we also look at verse 46 where the early Christians were continually, da continuing daily with one another in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, eating their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And the word gladness in verse 46 means that they had exceeding great joy. And the word picture is somewhat literally jumping for joy. These early Christians were overflowing with joy that they had in Christ Jesus. Jim Cain explained this kind of joy by saying, Joy is turning into what God is doing around you, seeing the world through his eyes. Happiness depends on what is happening to you. Joy is different. Joy goes deeper. Joy is when your whole being sings because you've caught a glimpse of God at work. What a great statement. See, they had exceeding, exceeding great joy. And in verse 47, it said they were praising God and having favor with all of the people. Now that was a glad church. And that's the way God wants our church to be. We also see that they were sharing praise. They were a worshiping church. These folks thought that they were coming in for a moment, but their lives were turned upside down, and just they just continued to find ways to praise God. They had worship services with no clocks, no schedules, no emergencies, just time with the one that they adored. You share your worship and your praise away from the room that you're in right now. I mean, do you go outside of your place and let people know about the greatness of God? Do you find yourself singing at things you, you had no business singing about? Someone asked you about it. This is what the church did, and so can ours. But also we saw, probably more than anything, that they were sharing by telling. They were a reaching church. They were telling other people. And it says, and the Lord added to their number daily. How did this happen? And others were being told. They didn't have Facebook to go about making it happen. They didn't have to sit on their couch and text somebody and say, I want you to know something. They were out talking about it. They were out sharing it. And stories were being woven. And in short, they shared their lives and their love. And that's what God wants us to do. Will you do it? Well, let me close by telling you this story uh, about Fritz Keisler. Fritz Keisler was, uh, he lived from 1875 to 1962, and he was a world famous violinist. He'd earned a fortune with his concerts and his comp compositions, but he generously gave most of it away. And so when he discovered an, an exquisite violin on one of his trips, he wasn't able to buy it. And later, having raised enough money to meet the asking price, he returned to the seller hoping to buy the beautiful instrument, but to his great dismay, it had been sold to a collector. Keisler made his way to the new owner's home and offered to buy the violin. And the collector said it had become his prized possession and he would not sell it. Keenly disappointed, Keisler was about to leave when he had an idea. Could I play the instrument once before it's consigned to silence? Permission was granted, and the great virtuoso filled the room with such heart-moving music that the collector's emotions were deeply stirred. And he said, I have no right to keep that for myself, he exclaimed. It's yours, Mr. Keisler. Take it to the world 
and let the people hear it. And oh, how I want you to know, in the series that we've been in about threads, would you take it to the world and would you let people hear it? Well, church, we've been on quite a journey over the last several weeks talking about threads. And again, how do we go about initiating conversations about the character of God, the sinfulness of man? And we talk about the urgency of heaven, and we talk about the the necessity for salvation. And we look forward to the opportunities of weaving our story into the lives of the people that we have in contact with. I don't know how I want you to take that violin that's been handed to you, and would you play it in such a way that people want to hear more? and more about the goodness of God. We are called, as long as we have breath, to direct our lives around the people of others. I love hearing the stories about people in the hospital or in nursing homes or in rehab centers who are absolutely sharing the gospel with people around them, and they're not doing well for themselves. We never give up. We never quit. We continue to demonstrate that we want to compel people to want to know more about who Christ Jesus is. Let me pray for you on that journey where you're at right now, and I want you to know if you've not made any decision to move in your story, into the story that we're talking about, where Christ Jesus comes to save you from your sins, would you give us a call? Would you give one of the elders a call? Would you call a friend or a neighbor, and would you allow us to be able to talk with you? Let me pray for you as we close. Lord, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for what you're doing in us. I thank you for the series we've had called Threads. I pray that it would change us and make us different. We love you. We praise you. Send us on our way, God, to live a life of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Thanks for tuning in.